Welcome everybody to today's Intelligent Property Investor Masterclass. There's been a fair bit going on and a lot of talk about what's going to happen. Interest rates, um, you know, housing, can it go any further? Well, I want to go through the facts that have come out this week. What, we, what they mean and what they mean for you as a property investor. Now, look, if you're listening to me on any of the platforms which are podcast related, uh, make sure that you at some stage jump across to my website and get all the charts that I'm sharing with you today as well. So that's on iloverealestate.tv and you can get all the charts for today, which is uh, I know is going to be very, very helpful to you. So let's get into this week's masterclass. First up, how investors are making hay on the tightest uh, rental market that we have ever seen. And believe me, if you're a renter, you'll be feeling it. How property prices kept surging into the new year and which has led to, and which city is actually leading the way in that regard. Why we have seen uh, such a shortage of rental accommodation and which city is suffering the most all about rentals this time because obviously as investors we need to know about rentals because that's obviously our income but also we need to know where they're heading because a lot of investors that maybe weren't property investors are now jumping into the property market simply because the yields are so high and what the border reopening will do for Australian property and of course why the uh, race for space is changing how we're building. It's a little bit of a, a change in, in what that means for pricing of existing houses as well. So we'll get into that throughout this, this week's masterclass. So let's get into it. Let's start with the housing boom. Now, this extended right through into January. CoreLogic came out with some data that showed that the pace of growth is starting to slow a little bit. Um, in the, the major capital cities, but Adelaide and Brisbane particularly are really taking off. There's been strong sales volumes, meaning that, that uh, stock on the market has taken another leg down. So, you know, strong sales means that everything that's been available is now selling, which means there's not a lot of stock on the market. Now, that's really pushing a shortage in the houses uh, or homes available for sale. And you can see that in the figures. I mean, if you look at the dwelling values and how much they've gone up. Now, this is, uh, this is the, the, the latest figures through to February. And you can see there that, uh, you know, across the last 12 months, we're looking at a 22% increase across Australia. Now, that's come down slightly from the December figures, um, but it's still really high. I mean, let's face it, everybody knows last year, 2021, prices absolutely skyrocketed. And you can see there in some areas like regional Tasmania, 20, you know, nearly 30, 30%. But of course, that's not sustainable. Um, and what I expect to see is there's going to be a lot of cooling happening, particularly in the regions, because there's only so much that the regions can take. Whereas in the cities, I have a very different view. Now, I'm not saying that there's going to be a major crash in the regional areas. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is that things are going to start to slow down now. Um, I and mean, some capitals are actually going to outperform others. But as we've seen, if we look back historically, there's been massive increase um, over the last 12 months. So the rolling three-month change you can see here, which cities are starting to cool in uh, sale pricing over the last three months? And you can see there it's Sydney, Perth and Melbourne. Now, that leaves Adelaide and Brisbane particularly right out there in the opposite direction because prices have continued to rise in, uh, in those two states. Now, partly that is due to affordability um, because housing is cheaper in Adelaide and in Brisbane than the other states, the other cities there that you can see. So we're going to see a little bit of a, a, a not, not so much a, it's not a drop in pricing and it's certainly not a crash, which some people are predicting. This is more of an easing. So what we're going to see is prices are still going to increase, but not at the same rate that we've been seeing through 2021. And really, thank goodness for that because uh, they've been absolutely off the charts. But in Brisbane and Adelaide, they're stronger than the rest, is really what I'm saying in those charts. So you can see here, when we look at the combined capitals versus the combined regionals, regionals are still pretty high. 
You can see there that the regionals are, uh, you know, still up at, you know, 6.3, whereas the combined capitals have actually started to come down a little bit at, at, uh, at uh, 2.6. But that is mainly due to Sydney and Melbourne, um, to a lesser extent Perth, rather than anything else. It doesn't affect the other, the other capitals. This is, this is why we're, we're starting to see um, things still ticking along and still going up generally, but not, from, not as much as they were before, is that new listings have come off. So we're starting to see that new listings are not as strong as they have been, um, and uh, particularly through to December, which December obviously things cut back anyway because people think no one's going to buy anything over Christmas. Um, so that's a, that's a traditional thing that, that happens. But if you look at where we are there in January, we've picked up pretty much in line with, um, you know, with, with what we've been doing in previous years. Because you can see all those other, those other lines, you can see you know, what years they relate to, and you can see the very dark blue one is 2022. So we're obviously there uh, showing into, into February. We're following the trend that we've been following for years and years after that because Christmas comes down and then we start to pick up into the new year. But this is the story. What we're seeing is that sales volume, um, it is, everything is selling. So new listings are pretty much on par with what we were getting previously, but everything is selling. So because everything is selling, what that means is that if you look at this chart, sales listings are down. There's simply not as much for sale as there normally is. I mean, just look at that chart. You can see there that goes back to 2018 and every year, including last year, which was a low year anyway, a record low in fact for the number of listings on the market, we are even lower. So we're now into the figures there for February and you can see we are even lower than we have been in 2021, which was an incredibly low year to start with. So that's what we're, that's what we're up against um, and you can see there that uh, because of the low volume of properties for sale, uh, even though the new listings are on par, there's simply not enough for sale across the board because everything that's there is pretty much getting sold. So that's, the, that's the, what we're facing into this year. And I don't think that that trend is actually going to change very much. I think it's going to remain pretty much what it is. I think we're going to see low listings across the board because our construction is lagging. So we simply don't have the, uh, the volume of new construction coming onto the market. Now, that is partly due to what happened back in 2017 when APRA got themselves involved and they basically killed the economy by killing the ability to be able to finance. So as the, uh, as the financing came down, then, um, you know, we weren't able to, bu to buy properties. We still wanted to buy properties. So demand was still up, but supply was down. And a lot of the big boys that were, um, you know, producing the big high rises and all the rest of it, they take two and a half years to, uh, to produce a property and get it for sale. Now, they stopped construction through till really the end of 2020. And we are still playing catch up with that. So that's why we have such a shortage at the moment. Um, and I don't see that changing through 2022. We may start to pick up um, on that stakes into 2023, but certainly not in 2022, which means we've got more added pressure on housing um, and house pricing. Even though I don't think it'll be the same kind of pace that we saw in 2021, it's still going to be a, an upward trend. So it's not time to sit back and try and wait for a crash because there's a hell of a lot of up before we get into an oversupply, which is when any market then goes into correction. So what will the border reopening do to properties? Well, uh, it, 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 it's kind of two-pronged. Rental markets are already incredibly tight. So as population flows, it'll put a lot of pressure on rentals and on pricing in the popular areas. So in some areas, and I'll put Northern Territory out there as an example, a lot of people have been renting up there because that's where they work. Um, same a little bit for, uh, for Perth. And a lot of people have uh, you know, moved to those areas temporarily because um, they know they need to work and they haven't been able to go in and out, particularly in the mining areas. So what you're going to see now is in some of those areas, and I think Darwin is, is a major one of this, you will start to see some easing. 
But what you're going to see in other areas where it's desirable to live, and I'm not sorry for everyone who lives in, in the Northern Territory, but people want to live on the coast and all the rest of it and you know, places like South East Queensland and the like, they're going to get even more pressure on rentals and therefore pricing. So the end of Fortress Australia. So we're not just opening up the borders internally, but we're opening up the borders internationally. Now, when someone comes in, what do they do? They rent. And as they rent, that puts more pressure. Where do they mainly go? They go to Sydney and Melbourne first, and then they go to Queensland and Perth and then Adelaide and the rest of the, the country kind of fills in there. A little bit into Canberra because of all the diplomatic uh, rentals and, and other things coming in. So Fortress Australia is coming down, which means that we're going to see um, a bigger pressure even on rentals than we've seen before. And that's really going to, to uh, make it difficult if you're out there renting. There's going to be a lot more share housing. There's going to be a lot more, uh, you know, group living. And I believe in the long term, there'll probably be a lot more group buying as well, where sisters and brothers come together to buy a place together or mates come together to buy a place together rather than everyone goes out there and buys their own place. So this chart really gives you an indication as to what's happened with um, arrivals and departures. So COVID came along and nobody went anywhere, in or out, basically. Now we've started to open up a little bit, but look at that chart. You can see just how far that chart has to go up to get anywhere close to where we were pre the uh, pre-COVID and, and everything else. So, you know, that's going to that's gonna add a lot more pressure. And, you know, you, you look at the, the numbers there and we're talking about the millions of people coming in that right, you know, prior to the borders I'm out, aren't coming in and that, where are they going to go? They're going to go, some are going to hotels, but a lot are going to go into rental accommodation and that's going to push up pricing even further. Now, it's probably, um, you know, uh, uh, predictable that this is going to happen because, as you can see here, this is the locally acquired COVID cases for both Sydney or New South Wales and Victoria. And you can see that they're well and truly over the peak of Omicron and everything there. Um, and what that means is the active cases have also come down. So the, the obvious story is that, yes, we're going to open up the borders and uh, the next thing after that is going to be opening up the borders for immigration. And that, believe me, is going to come. So we're across the, we're across the peak for both Victoria and for New South Wales, for hospitalisations and all the other stuff, rigmarole that we've all been hearing too much about as far as I'm concerned. So tenants are struggling to find homes as rental vacan uh, vacancy rates hit new lows. Now that's been put out by uh, Domain and they track the vacancies on properties and uh, vacancies are at all time lows. I mean, if you look at this chart here, you can see how the vacancy rate across the capital cities is, you know, it's down in the, in the point, point 0.4, point 0.3 percentile. So that is incredibly low. And if you look at that, you know, compared to the, uh, the vacancy rate per capital city, um, you can see there that, you know, we're, we're way down on where we have been in previous years. The vacancy rate, oh, same chart, sorry. Um, which way am I going here? I was pressing the wrong button. I was on you. Sorry, Dal. So what we've got now is we have um, the immigration. So this is what I said. We've got the, the migration, the arrivals coming in, which a lot of those are on tourist visas and, and other things. Some of them are on temporary visas. Some of them are on work visas and all of that kind of stuff. And a lot of that does go into the rental market. But as soon as we open up the migration, and this has been put out, as you can see there by the Australian Bureau of Statistics, as to the level that they expect to be bringing in. Now, depending on what happens this year, I actually feel it could be higher than that. I mean, they're predicting somewhere around the 250,000 new people coming into the country as migrants. You know, it could be up as 400,000 new people. Now, where do they predominantly go? Sydney and Melbourne. So what's going to happen in those markets? Not only for rentals, but then obviously for house prices as well. Now, on top of that, we've got this amazing race for space. Now, we're not talking about, you know, getting land lots in Ma on Mars or on the moon or anywhere else or in these ridiculous scams that come out. Um, but what it has proven through COVID is that Australians are actually building bigger homes. And um, 
Now, this has come on the back of homes actually falling in size um, as a bit of a trend in previous years. We've reversed that now and we're getting bigger. So, uh, in particular, Australians want bigger units. Now, this is really changing the space in the apartment market that, um, you know, the, a lot of people are actually moving to the apartment market so that they can travel and other things and don't have to worry about a lawn, but they want the bigger spaces. They don't want little little boxes. They don't want the little two-bedders. They don't want the little one-bedders. They want the big three and four and sometimes five-bedroom apartments, um, which is going to be a home as opposed to just a rental rubbish that's, that's out there. Um, so at the same time, as we're getting bigger houses, and bigger units, we're also putting less people in them. So there's less people living in these bigger dwellings. Now, this helps explain the rental markets and why they're so tight on top of everything else that I've been talking about as well. So this shows you here how home sizes have hovered um, near the six year high. Um, and you can see there back in 1985, this, you know, the, the room, the house size was back at about 150 square metres. And then we progressively got bigger through to GFC, 2008. We peaked where our house sizes were up at 220 uh, uh, square metres, 220,000, square metres. And now then they dropped off um, through to 2017. Now really, that was, a, that was a story about affordability more than anything else. But now we've started to increase that size again. And the average home size lifts in the COVID era. And that just shows you the same kind of thing, but in quarters. This chart here is pretty interesting because what it shows is which states are building the biggest houses. Well, it's actually, you guessed it, Perth, in particular WA. Um, but the one that surprised the heck out of me was Victoria. So Victoria's coming in second, then Queensland. I would have expected Queensland to be second. Then we have the Northern Territory, then South Australia, then the ACT, and then the stragglers of New South Wales and Tassie. Now, that absolutely blew me away when I saw those charts. I really thought WA and Queensland would have been right out there ahead of everybody else. Um, I certainly didn't expect New South Wales to be so low in the, in the chart there on house sizes. So um, Australians are wanting more space and that's really showing particularly through, through COVID 2020 and 2021 um, and into 22, the demand for larger floor plans has been off the charts. So we, are, we still have a long way to, uh, to come down if we want to in size because we're right up there with uh, the US. They are one of the biggest and they have the, you know, they have the, um, some of the biggest houses in the world. Now, we've, we've actually come off uh, their sizing for a few years, but then we peaked above them and now we're about the same size, uh, wanting the same size housing as, as uh, the US. And it's certainly a lot bigger than most other places. I mean, I think you can put seven um, homes in Hong Kong into one of our standard four bedroom, two bathroom, double lock up garage homes in Australia. That's how big we are compared to some other countries. So Aussies need more personal space. And um, with that, we're putting less people in the housing. The housing is, housing is getting bigger, particularly in the unit market. Um, and that's putting more pressure on rentals on top of everything else. So there's no sign of reduction in pressure on pricing, both for rentals and for housing. And here's a bit of a thought for you. You might get 85 years on this planet. That's kind of the, the average lifespan at the moment. But don't spend 65 of them paying off a lifestyle you can't afford. Great quote there, and I've added to it. Invest wisely instead, then you will be able to have the lifestyle that you want. So get out there. Let's start getting into this market because don't think it's too late. There's still plenty of upside in the market. Um, and uh, But you've got to get into it. Time is ticking. So I really want you to take up one of my free 60-minute breakthrough sessions that I have available for you with one of my advisors. Make sure you go to the appointment and you click through and you, you, uh, you make an appointment. All you've got to do, if you're listening to me rather than seeing my slides, is go to iloverealestate.tv forward slash questions forward slash and then um, click through and you'll be able to, uh, to get one of those appointments, hopefully, if they're not all full. 
Now, they're 60 minutes long. They are free. And what I want you to do is come armed with what you want. Think about your goals. Think about what you want to achieve. Think about the lifestyle that you actually want to, want to live. And then my team can actually help you um, talk about what steps you need to take to actually achieve some of those things. We don't sell properties, remember that? That's not what this is about. This is about helping you achieve your goals. So jump on one of those breakthrough sessions. They're there for you guys. And I will be back next week to uh, talk to you about another amazing um, in development that's happening in the property market and how, how it affects you. So that's it for me, guys. Thank you, and I'll catch you next week. Bye now.